It's the Bill King Show. Welcome in. Jessica Bellamy's back from the mountains, back from hiking in upstate New York. Yeah. I did 15, no, 16 miles, okay? Okay. Uh, in the Adirondacks, uh, right near Lake Placid. Absolutely gorgeous. This is day one or over the two days? Over the three days. Three days. Over the three days. And you sort of paced yourself? Yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't go hard. Uh, the first two hikes, um, they were short. However, I, there was some mountain, there was some rock climbing. There was a little scrambling. I had to take a few, <laughs> a few breaks, drink some water. Um, so that was that first one was uh, Mount Joe, and you got a beautiful view of the entire mountain range ranges, and it was breathtaking. I have to. I think I sent you a picture of it. The fall colors. The fall colors, and it's just like awe inspiring. You know, and you just get on top and you just you see people just looking at each other, just gleeful and happy and just like <laughs> at peace you know, like with their families and just reveling in this whole experience of being in nature. And we need to do that for ourselves. Have you been there before? Or how did you find this? Why the Adirondacks? Just something different. I've never been. Okay. Never been. So um, you just looked it up on a map or on an online and said, this is where I'm going. This is where I'm going. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've been uh, to the White Mountains, the Green Mountains um, in uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, respectively, um, but never done any hiking in, in uh, up, upstate New York, but it's worth it. It's only a six-hour drive. Now, Jesse sent me a clip the other day from SCTV. Mm -hmm. I laughed so much. It was. I, it, it's a reminder that that's true comedy. Uh, Saturday Night Live could not touch this, but you have news on John Candy. Yes, yes. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, in collaboration with uh, Colin Hanks, they're working on a documentary on John Candy. So that'll be coming out soon. And there will be home uh, videos, uh, thanks to his daughter, and uh, some archival footage. And I grew up on uh, John Candy. Um, oh, was he funny? Spaceballs, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, Spaceballs. Space balls, yeah. um, of course. Uncle Buck. Uncle Buck. Yes. Um, the Great Outdoors. Yes. And he had to eat that huge steak. Well, there's steak. your inspiration. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep, my cabin inspiration. And, of course, planes, trains, and automobiles, which is such a tearjerker and such a wonderful, wonderful film. With uh, Danny McBride and uh, Chris Carninus, we used to do the SCTV annual Christmas party. Mm. They'd all be there. And John Candy, in the one we did, one of them we did, he brought out this basket, uh, just a, you know, like a, a clothes basket. And put it on stage, and he told everybody to gather around. He had gifts for all the, you know, Andrea Martin, all of them, right? And they're all excited. He goes, it's Christmas, and, and I didn't forget you, right? And so he said, just come up here and put your hand in there. Just put your hand in there. And they're looking like, you know, is there snakes in this thing or what, right? And he reached down, there were keychains. <laughs> little keychains <laughs> and little name tags. <laughs> and they all looked at him like, what? And then they walked away, and the rest of the night, you were just... Stepping on keychains and name tags, you know, and he goes from my bottom, from the bottom of my heart, you know, it was very funny. Is this treating yourself or is this, this being good to yourself, right? This is being good that to yourself. Moment. Yeah. Um, so other ship, uh, right downtown on Adelaide. So Adelaide's the Dinah area, um, great wellness center, uh, go in for a meditative experience. You can do it as a group or by yourself. So you go in for a sauna and then a uh, cold plunge. And so you stay in the cold. I'm telling you, it's freezing cold. There are bags of ice. I saw them putting bags of ice into these, uh, into these pools. And so you stay there for a minute to three minutes. And it's, it's invigorating. It's kind of scary, but you have to like settle into it. And as I'm thinking about booking my, my next session... I came across an article about like a few months ago. People are paying uh, like $100,000 plus for these uh, live forever type of treatments or at least until 120 years old. And I'm just like, like, what is the point? <laughs> like, and it includes some of this stuff, like, you know, the meditation and like they had some other weird thing called like some sort of 
fecal extraction treatment. I was like, I'm, I don't want to know. You're what not that's going for about. that one. No, uh, cold plunge, cryogenic therapies, and all this and that. And I'm like, I'm just doing this for today. You know, yes. like 120 <laughs> years old. I don't need to live that long. I think the body sort of limits itself and it has a clock. Yeah. Everybody has a clock on it. Mm -hmm. It's off the subject just a bit, but our dog is, uh, will one day be 17. Or oh, this is a great example. Okay. He's incredible. We got his blood test back today. He is incredibly healthy, but he has dementia. Mm. So, all right, I weigh this and the frustration he has at night. It's dark. He can't hear. He can barely see. So he has to live in his head. Now, I got to weigh his, his well-being through this, too. All right. He's healthier than most dogs will ever be at this age. But yet he's still fighting the things that come with old age. And I think that's the other thought, you know. Yeah. It's, it's all about the quality of life. I think so. Um, because what is it uh, to live to 100 years old, yet your faculties are extremely limited or you rely on uh, family members to take care of you or do the, like, the most simplest things, right? Um, so that 120, I think it has to do with the fear of death and the fear I of think so. what's on the other side. Yeah, yeah. So to try to stave it off as, as much as possible is, is he only human. It is, it's only human. I understand that. Not to be maudlin, I had a conversation with my sister who uh, just randomly, this uh, elderly woman, um, she was helping open a door or something into a church, um, was just talking to her and just saying like, you know what, I'm like 90 years old. It's a yaya, a Greek uh, grandmother. You know, I have eight grandkids, five uh, great grandchildren. She's like, you know what, my knee's bothering me. I lived a long life. I'm ready to go. <laughs> My mom used to say that yeah, all the time. I'm done. <laughs> See you later. I'm good to go. Yeah. And Jay's like, oh, do you want me to <laughs> add that to my prayer Accelerate list? this? Yeah, what? you know what I mean? I'll, I'll put in a good word when I, when I say my nighttime prayers just to, you know. Well, you know something? I was reading an article on the word conductor mm. uh, in music terms. Originally, it, it was thought of as that person that led people into the afterlife in many cultures. And music played a part of that. And that the conductor was the one that stood there and just sort of led people where they would go. Oh, wow. And, and I never thought of that. We always think of an orchestra. But then you have to stop and think conductors on railroads, uh, you know, where there's seating people. It's just that one word has, much, has a much broader meaning. Yeah, and a great responsibility. Great responsibility <laughs> <laughs> to be there. Hey, Jessica, that's great stuff. Uh, anything else you want to talk about here? Ooh, um, we'll have fundraising coming up in November. <laughs> okay, well, you can lay that on us now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we, yeah, we, you know, we got to raise some money here too. Yep. Coming up uh, because we're here every Saturday afternoon, the Bill King Show from one to two, and I always say, remind people what we do is we're, we're a magazine. We're your Saturday afternoon magazine, which relates to our city and our country. So when we have Gloria Martin coming up soon here in a few minutes, it's about film, TV, and events. When we have Mark Hepsher come in, Mark is an expert on sports and his commentaries. I just let him go. You know, I just maybe say two words and, and then say goodbye, Mark. Thanks for <laughs> dropping by. But. He's so good at what he does, and, and he really, his mind is in sports 24 hours a day. So we have these great people, and you're here, and we have broad topics to discuss, and we have uh, one great interview, which is coming up, which is Andy Milne, the jazz pianist. Nice. Yeah, I know. I've been, you know, he's been he, he living in New York. He lived there for 30 years, and he's now in Ann Arbor, Michigan, right? And he's at university there okay. in the jazz studies. Team. We had a great conversation. He was in the same seat you were sitting in yesterday. So it's all good. It was still warm. <laughs> it's still warm. It's got that jazz feel to it. <laughs> yep. Anyway, Jessica, let's get on with the show. It's yeah. the Bill King Show. Coming up right now, Andy Milne.
Pianist Annie Milne is a fearless, versatile explorer as a pianist and composer. He has been a distinct and respected voice at the heart of New York's creative jazz scene for almost 30 years, collaborating with dancers, visual artists, poets, and musicians spanning jazz, classical, pop, folk, and world music. At the piano, he skillfully blends poetic gravitas with a playful sense of order. He has recorded and toured throughout the world with Ravi Coltrane, Ralph Alisi, Carlos Ward, Carla Cook, and has collaborated with a range of artists, including Andrew Cyril, Sekou Sundiata, Avery Brooks, Bruce Coburn, Fred Hirsch, Ben Monder, Diane Reeves, and others. We talk. You are now in Ann Arbor, Michigan? Yeah. And why? Uh, because I took a position at the University of Michigan about four years ago. Um, taking, uh, took over for Benny Green when he left and, uh, been living there since I guess 2018 is when I started teaching there, but then I, I, I started living there in 2019. This jazz studies? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Fairly good sized department. I mean, as departments go, it's probably not massive. I mean, I've been in bigger programs in, in New York, but I mean, it's, it's, we have roughly 70 students, six, you know, between undergraduate and, and graduate and, and graduate. And your work is with mostly, I mean, I teach all the pianists and then I teach some other instruments It's not, not teaching the, to play those instruments, but I teach students who play other instruments as well. I teach, uh, I sort of lead the large ensemble or the small ensemble program as well. And you have a degree. I have a degree at York, an undergraduate degree, but I'm, I'm one of those, uh, you know, full-time faculty in jazz that uh, they value my that's great life experience on the road and whatnot you know it has been going on for quite a while since the early 90s right or, that program yeah 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 uh before that where'd you teach before that i was teaching in new york i was living there and i was teaching at at one point at three different schools but largely i was teaching at the new school and nyu for many years i thought i think i taught a new school for 17 years the family is from Hamilton? I was born in Hamilton. Was born I, in I, Hamilton. I, was, I was adopted, so I never lived in Hamilton. The Canadian connection. So where where did you grow up? I grew up in, in Kincardine and in Toronto. And then I moved to Montreal, and then I left and went to New York. And, and piano early on? Was this music? Yeah, I started, music? I started taking lessons when I was about six. Yeah? Six or seven. I Family think. thing or parents? They didn't. They, they weren't musicians. They just everybody got an opportunity to, to you know, take some piano lessons, and I just took to it. Yeah. And part of the Montreal jazz scene then eventually. When I lived there for the brief time, yeah, yeah, for sure, it was really formative because I I had just gotten out of school here in Toronto. I just graduated from York, and then I moved that following, like that summer, right at the end of that summer, basically when I graduated, I went to Banff, and then mm -hmm. moved to Montreal. Now, was Oscar the chancellor then of the music department? Oscar or? was sort of, we called him Mr. Various because he, <laughs> or my ensemble was Mr. Various, which meant that lots of different people uh, worked with us, but it was sort of Oscar's ensemble, and he would come in whenever he was mm -hmm. around. And now, were you able to get some piano time with him? I couldn't get like real one-on-one -on -one piano time yeah, with him. Yeah, but he just overall. Yeah, I mean, he, he would come in and play. You know, and, and play, you know, right after I'd played. And, or, you know, so I, I got piano time like that, but it wasn't discreet one-on-one -on -one piano time. Yeah, it was my, that was my piano time with him in 1963. Oh, yeah? At his school. Yeah. Uh, it was the whole thing of having him in the room where you could sit down and look at his hands. Yeah. Up close. Right, right. I wanted to see where those chords were. See where the chords were. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't finding them. <laughs> You're like, he's got a piano with extra notes. It has to be. Yeah, because he, he played with 10 fingers. Yeah. You know, sometimes the chords were just a, a, across the keyboard, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So yeah. watching up close. And who else was, was there like a rhythm section thing? Would he play with others? You mean, you mean in terms of yeah, of, himself. Of, of, his, of his generation, you mean? or No, no in, in the classes, would he play with other musicians or just on his own teach and so? I'm trying to think if, if there were times when he would take over, sit down and play the piano with the ensemble or not. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that happening, actually, right. now that you mentioned it. Um, is, maybe it did it once or twice, but I don't remember that happening. Was he influential to you at the beginning? 
or were you listening to other pianists like Monk and... Oh, no, he was like the reason why I play. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, growing up in Canada and, and just like discovering of his existence and his influence was like huge. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's what catapulted me in being... His one is, you know, Night Train was one of my first records. Not first one, but like... There, I have this other record that was like... It's just this, it's one of those weird issues where it's just like this orange cover. You know? okay. <laughs> I think Clark Terry was on the record. It's like that was probably one of the first jazz records. I got. My brother-in-law turned yeah. me on to a lot of my early recordings. I mean, Keith Jarrett would have been in play in Herbie Hancock mm -hmm. eventually. But, the, but before those guys, I think actually Bill Evans was... was Bill Evans was, was the guy. Was a really early... Yeah. And I got hip to him about a month or two before he died and he was of course here in toronto like his one i think his last show was in toronto i really wanted to go and my brother-in-law he still regrets the fact that he couldn't take me because then you know bill passed like literally you know and like, he was playing upstairs i think at a club or something i thought it was like yeah. bourbon street or something like yeah. that yeah bourbon street yeah. one of those yeah yeah I, we went christine and i went to one of his last performances and pat la barber was saving a chair for us or, really? or a couple of, at a table and we were outside of it they said it's packed and you can't get in but they had the two chairs we just sat in the hallway and listened <laughs> we sat on the stairwell and listened wow it was wow. it was beautiful i bet yeah yeah i yeah, know i would i would i mean because he died in what 80 mm -hmm. right i think it was that somewhere in there yeah so i was like yeah i was you know underage of course but it was just like i i would have needed my brother-in-law to take me to the gig you know but but, uh, yeah, that wasn't meant to be. But that was sort of like, I think, Bill and then, you know, I guess at the time I was checking out Herbie and then I, I was slow to figure out how to get into Monk. I got into Monk when a friend of mine, yeah, uh, his older brother had a lot of recordings and we would go to, over to his house after school and he would just kind of go, you call yourself a jazz musician, you're not into Monk yet? And, uh, and he just sort of like kind of shamed me into kind of really trying to figure out how I could find <laughs> find a way in. But it was really when that Straight No Tracer movie came out and I got to watch him play that it, yeah. it, it triggered this whole newfound appreciation for him as a pianist. I was really attached to all the Blue Note sides. But there were pianists like Andrew Hill mm. that I didn't get at the time. Right. And I came back in later in life and I liked him even more. Right. I don't know what that was about. Well, it's just funny how you don't you're not for it. I remember when I when I when I moved to New York and I spent a lot of time you know, just informal kind of uh mentorship with Muhal Richard Abrams. And Muhal would say things to me sometimes about like, you know, you you just you, you know, you don't you're not going to hear that right now. And he would he would even kind of couch the way he would um mentor me where he didn't even bother to he he would just he would present things when he felt I could process them. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's an interesting thing about you know of course if you're just on your own trying to discover something and you come across it and you're like i don't like this you don't have anybody to curate that experience for like right. what's the timing you know but if you have somebody that's you know able to kind of say mm, we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks or whatever you know and it must also helped in help you in finding yourself as a player as you see it you went your own way i went my own way but it was yeah. part, it's partly because of you know I think, you know, all the players that I was interested in as, at a really formative age were not terribly um, atypical of lots of other people mm -hmm. in my generation, right? But I think what was unique for me was the experiences that I ended up finding myself in musically that required me to, um, you know, channel uh, just another way of hearing and really diff different types of skills that, you know, both pianistic and just listening skills that I think that kind of shaped how I was going to develop as a player, M more so than me sort of singling out this particular unusual player and going, I want to mm -hmm. really dive into them. I think there was a, you know, an element of that, but I think it's also just like how you learn how to hear based upon, well, you're being asked to do mm -hmm. this in this musical situation, and maybe that's a little different than someone else that you came up with uh dap theory mm -hmm. uh, that was your er, your early group yeah i guess it, it sort of evo it evolved into dap theory yeah. over the course of a couple of years and then around 1999 was when i was making this recording and that was the was second recording i'd made and it was that's my my ears were sort of formulating i had done a actually it was weird i had done a 
a concert for CBC, for Jazz Beat in, in Montreal when they were still doing those in the studio mm-hmm. things, right, with Alain de Grobois and Katie Malik. And I remember coming up from New York with, with my group, but it was like a, kind of an extended group because I was like, wow, there's, there's enough money to pay people. I've been hearing this. I want to try this. And so I think we did a gig in Montreal maybe and then did – and then did uh, did the recording at the studio, and so there's one song on the first Abdi record that came from that uh, license from that CBC recording because it was kind of like oh this is where I think I want to go with this group, and so then the next year or so it was sort of like kind of came into fruition. You don't want to give it up. You want to hold on to that track. Which I said the one to CBC. No, I understand that because there were things that it's already there. Yeah, you yeah, know. So he licensed uh, it for the album. Yeah, which was, good. But it was great because it was like. But I'm trying to think though. Was it? Yeah, yeah. So it's like the one. It's the one piece on the album that's like mm-hmm. recorded in a totally different environment and nice piano and all this kind of stuff. But, yeah. but uh, you know, it it really. I think it just that. I remember that road trip was kind of like defining. Like okay, yeah. And then that following summer, I toured with that. Um, large version of the group and then I really it, it kind of helped me uh, sort of see where I wanted to go with that and then of course the personnel changed at various times over the next several years you know um, and several albums and stuff but and, you know my concept evolved and whatnot. but but it definitely started in those sort of early phases there like 99 and 2000 How much influence has hip hop had on you? Not a huge influence in 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 the sense of directly where I'm listening and going. I'm putting that in my music more like I hear it and and I put it I put the sound of what I hear, or it informs the way I kind of go. Well, I'm I'm not rejecting sounds if I hear them right. It's but like spoken a, word find place in your music. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I guess that intersection of where spoken word um, aligns with hip hop or aligns in terms of its energy or in terms of the messaging or in terms of the just the role or the melodicism of it or the rhythmic melodicism of it and the, these things find their way and you learn how to interpret them but i mean definitely because when i was working with steve coleman i mean he had several rappers in the group at one point and you know one of whom went on to be in the first version of Dap there he's kokai so there's a lot of that influence it's almost like secondary because it's like that influence of hip-hop was there in that group of steve's mm-hmm. which you know, I was in, and therefore it, it just channeled itself into where I was going with, with Dap Theory. Is there a recording where you say, I found myself? I finally know exactly where I want to be playing-wise and, and how I hear things. It's funny. I think if you hadn't said playing-wise, I would have just, I would have been, I would have actually thought about that from the point of view of being a composer. Okay, let's say from composer. Because uh, as a composer, I think finding myself as a composer mm-hmm. probably the album that people never hear because it just kind of went under the radar. <laughs> There's an album called Forward in All Directions that the great bass player Jimmy Haslip produced for mm-hmm. me. And that record, I think, probably was like that turning point of like, okay, I'm, I think I understand how to create um, the various textures that I would like to uh, express mm-hmm. as a composer. And then I think probably maybe as a player, maybe as a player too. I mean, as as a, if you're talking about albums as a leader, if you're talking about albums just that I've been on, I mean, I certainly feel like there was periods early in the middle period of being in Coleman's group where I felt I was maturing as a player in that band in terms of what I could offer. Mm-hmm. But I mean, of course, you you gain huge insights over time playing with other people and adapting to their environments and then finding what, what it is that, that you can provide and what you need to work on to kind of be able to provide it better, you know? And, and I think, so probably the period after I left Coleman's group and, you know, really when I finally left was like 2001 and that next decade of differing and experience, differing experiences with, with, with my own groups and other people was probably like where I got to sort of feel like I was, clicking as a as a player and then it, but i hope it's not i don't even want to be sort of definitive about it because i kind of feel like there's so many opportunities i'm having right now it that, keeps evolving it keeps evolving yeah, where it, does, I, does, does. It, it kind of go hit me going wow i wouldn't have been able to do this four years ago <laughs> well i always i always go by the thing that uh, uh as a player you gather 
all of this uh, insight and also so much of it you can't even pinpoint and why you do what you do and how you hear and how you play because it's your history. Yeah. And history is just like it keeps registering. Yeah. And it stays with you and you can't. And even I, I even believe ancestors play a role in this too. I, I think ancestors communicate with you in such a way that, yeah, you know, let's speak through them in such a way because we still have something to say. Yeah, they're adding to your story. They're adding they're to part the story. of your story. They're adding yeah. to your story. Yeah. It's Hebsey on Sports. Hebsey's in the house. He had a nice walkover. I did, in the rain. In the rain. It's okay, though. It's a nice neighborhood to walk in. Did you sing? I did, as a matter of fact. What what were you singing? Well, I was singing (laughs) some John Prine, actually. I love John Prine. Big fan of John Prine. So Spanish Pipe Dream and uh, oh, yeah. In Spite of Ourselves. and Oh, God, is that a great to do that? Uh, Angel Iris from Demet. Montgomery. Iris DeMet. Yeah, with Iris DeMet. And an Angel, yeah. Angel from Montgomery with um, Bonnie Raitt. Yeah. Just, yeah, fabulous. I went to his uh, farm years ago. Nice. And went for the, um, the chili off oh, yeah. in Nashville. And he invited a lot of the country music celebrities. And I just yeah. happened to go with Bob Johnson, the producer. Nice. Well, I used to play his music yeah. back when I played your music, when I worked in Kitchener back in the late 70s. And so it, it was a country music s- station. Well, I guess it was. They, they, in the evenings, they played country music and all night. But I found that uh, it was limited. To, you know, the country music was kind of limited. So I kind of overnight, I would branch out. I'd play some Gordon Lightfoot. I'd play a little Bill King. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, to get the Canadian stuff. But also, I found that um, cu- country music at the time could take on a different meaning. Like the Eagles played, you know, country rock. There was that crossover. You know, you yeah. had the Flying yeah. Burrito Brothers. You, you know, you had a lot of stuff that could be qualified as country. And when I f- discovered John Prine, I went, man, this this is this will work. Yeah. This is, you know, nice ballads, stuff like that. And I would play it, even though it wasn't on the playlist. It wasn't Mel Tillis. It wasn't Crystal Gale. It wasn't Willie Nelson or Tom Paul Glazer or, or um, Waylon Jennings. Yeah. It was, so that was country music. And I remember my program director saying, whoa, whoa, what's that? And I said, well, it's John Prine. He goes, well, that's not on the playlist. I go, I know, but it's pretty good. <laughs> right? It's the lyrics. It's the words. Yeah, that was great. Oh, yeah. God. You know, anyway, yeah. even getting to that song you were talking about with Iris DeMent, he shaped the words in Beautiful. the story. It's just great writing, you know. So this he ain't, is, he ain't got laid in a month of Sundays. <laughs> I caught a, him sniffing my undies. 
<laughs> and she had the perfect voice yeah, for it. Yeah. She was just roots. Uh, I didn't know if you knew this or not, but this will play right into your wheelhouse, the great pickleball tournament mm. on for TV. It's called Pickled. Nice. Coming up, it's uh, Celebrity Pickleball, Fabulous. and it's uh, Stephen Colbert, mm -hmm. Charity, and it's going to feature everybody from uh, Sugar Ray Leonard. Emma Watson, Carrie Champion, uh, John Michael Higgins. In this competition, this is November 17th mm. at 9 p.m. It's going to be on TV. I expect you to be tuning in and doing the play-by-play. -play. Yeah, I can't watch pickleball on TV. I can't yeah, imagine. It's not. It's not a, to me, it's not a TV. It's a play. It's a, a participation sport. Yeah. But I don't think I could watch it on TV. I mean, doubles tennis is quick enough. Like, d doubles pickleball is ridiculous. You can't follow the ball. No. <laughs> and the sound. <laughs> but it's great. I'm glad that it's doing well. Uh, major League Baseball is partnering with Charlotte's Web, making the first of four major sports leagues to reach such a deal with CBD companies. Yeah. Well, it's about time. I mean, think about this. All the gambling sites. Once, once legalized sports gambling took over in many states and jurisdictions, right? I mean, that every part of the broadcast includes gambling odds. It's ridiculous. All of it. In fact, there's a fellow named Dom LeCision on Twitter who would always come up with the odds or, or good the prices for upcoming games. Um, and, and what happened was, and I'm not positive of this, but I think what happened was he, it, it's sort of like touting. It's sort of like saying, you know, the Leafs mm -hmm. are playing the Canadians. The Canadians are uh, half a puck favorites. So go with the Canadians. Well, what had happened was someone who had followed this guy apparently lost a fair bit of money gambling um, take, you know, because he took this fellow's um, advice, I guess, mm -hmm. his predictions. And when this fellow, Dom Lecision, found out about this, he, he said, I will not be doing any more. That's it. I'm not going to do any more uh, predict, pr predicting games and coming up with odds and lines and stuff like oh, that. You're in trouble, be be because, yeah. because he felt terrible that someone had taken his advice and, and lost money. And so, and I think it was a really bold step. And I don't know how much he was being paid or if he was being paid by, by, by a, a, you know, a gambling site. But he said he's not going to do it anymore. I thought that was a really interesting thing, a real good commentary. Like, he doesn't want to be a part of that. He doesn't want to be saying to someone, bet on this. And, and then if they lose, he feels guilty that, you know, somebody lost a considerable amount of money on his thing. He's not, you know, so he just said, I'm not going to do it anymore. But that's kind of the way things have gone. Like, I know people that um, aren't interested in sports, but they're interested in gambling on it. Like, I, I got to watch a four-hour ball game. I got to have a bet on it. And, right. you know, it, it, and now if you lose your bet, you're looking at things differently maybe than you were if you were just a fan. Yeah. Because now financially you're like, hey, you know, this guy here said that this, this team hurts. was the favorite and, uh, you know, so-and-so was pitching and the odds were good and then they scored seven runs and we lost the game. And so now when you hear people complain, you're like, did you lose money on this game? And that, and that will make people even more bitter. And second guess the manager and stuff like that. So I'm wondering how many, because there's a lot of people there that I wouldn't have given you two cents worth of. You know, there's no way they're fans of sports, but they're fans of gambling, or they 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 like to have a little action on the game, which that's, is all well and good if you can afford to lose that money if that's if that's entertainment money for you. But does that you go, bother you when you <laughs> when everything you open up on your laptop? Has a casino thing, has a gambling thing attached to it. Yeah. Or TV, it's yeah. in the bottom hand of the uh, right hand corner. Yeah, but but that's um, it's it's part of it now because that's mm -hmm. the reason these people are making so much money. These athletes are making so much money. These owners are making so much money. There's just so many more revenue streams, and if you're partnering with a, a gambling site, mm -hmm. uh, right, you you're encouraging gambling. Now, imagine this. Pete Rose gets suspended for life, barred for life from Major League Baseball for gambling, for betting on games. And what are they building in the Cincinnati ballpark? A casino. You can... <laughs> it, this is like me. Well, this is, this goes back to... Like the, if you're Pete Rose, you're going, wait a is, second here. Well, this is also the conversation CBD, cannabis compound, right? Yeah. That so many people were prosecuted, put in jail. I mean, if you was in Louisiana, you'd still be in jail. All right. And, and <laughs> of course, Joe Biden comes out this week and he pardons like 9,600 uh Pot offenders, yeah, jail. That should have never been, you know, that should None have never been a, a felony. I guess it would have been a felony, right? Yeah, Not a misdemeanor like, drug, no. but a felony drug. That possession. was Reagan. Yeah. yeah, that was Reagan mm -hmm. and right. Nixon and and those that follow, even right. Clinton to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They all had a hand in that, you know, the war on drugs. Well, this is the future of, of of sports. Is that uh, no? It doesn't matter. Eventually, uh, CBD companies, uh, marijuana companies, mm -hmm. for sure, would be involved in this. It is legal, just like gambling. Uh, it's legal in uh, look. New York State has already approved it. I mean, there are no dispensaries in New York State yet, 
for for um, recreational marijuana, but you can go to any um, native lands, the Mohawks, the Senecas in right. New York State, and you can buy it uh, no problem. Yeah. Now, have you used CBD? <clears throat> yeah. And does it work for you? It does. It does? Absolutely. Okay, because I've tried it for arthritis, and I got <clears throat> nothing from that. I guess it has to be a particular... Um, I, I guess I've tried it for uh, it. It does. It does have certainly. It has healing properties. Okay. Um, it's a natural analgesic. All right. right. Yeah. CBD. So, yeah. Maybe it's just a brand, or maybe it's. I, I, I don't know. Or maybe it just doesn't work for arthritis. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know, but um, you know, I know my dad takes it and helps him sleep, and it uh, okay. his joints don't uh, ache the way they did before. Certainly not. And there's no side effects like there is with some of the drugs. And I was like, you know, what are you taking for pain here? What is this stuff? That get (laughs) serious narcotics. So if that's the alternative, I'm okay with it. Pitching, going down the stretch in the playoffs, a lot of players got hit. It's still getting and we were watch I was watching the game last night, Mm -hmm. um Atlanta. Right. Oh God, that hurt. Um, yeah, I mean, hit by pitch. Yeah. Oh, you know, listen, the guys, guys throw hard and the ball gets away from you sometimes. A, a, a lot of times. And the other thing is, is look at some of these hitters are crowding the plate. You're a mm-hmm. pitcher. You say, look, I can't get, I got to get this guy off the plate. So you have to throw inside. You just have to. And so anytime there's a ball up and in the crowd, oh, he's trying to hit him. And no, he, if he was trying to hit him, trust me, he could hit him. If I'm a pitcher and I yeah. can find a little eighth of an inch on the corner of a plate, believe me, I can hit a six foot, two inch, 220 pound guy. <laughs> No problem. Where do you want him hit? In the foot? In the ankle? In the bum? Ribs? Right. Where right. do you want it? But, you know, to say, well, you know, listen, he's trying to brush the guy back. He's trying to get the guy off the plate. That's part of pitching. It, it just is. Uh, is there is there something similar to it in, in other sports? Sure. In hockey, if I lay a guy out in the first minute, if I hammer this guy, even if I get a penalty for it, I've sent a message. Don't be screwing with me. You come down again, I'm going to hit you again. And maybe the guy is a little timid next time he comes into the corner against me. So I'm, set, I'm setting the tone. I'm, I'm letting him know. Same yeah. thing with baseball. First inning, uh, a couple uh, up and in, uh, I'm not going to be crowding the plate so fast. Not going to be that comfortable in the batter's box. And if you're the pitcher, you want to make the batter uncomfortable. The batter can't make the pitcher feel the same way. He might be able to if you'd homered off him. But if I'm the pitcher and I got the ball, until I throw the ball, you're going to be wondering, what's this guy all about? Yeah. Is he throwing strikes? Is he wild? Can I dig in against him? Right? Let's say I get the first strike against you, and then the next one's you're leaning over, and I'm up and in. And now you're going, hey, hey, what's all that about? I'm like, hey, buddy, don't get too comfortable. <laughs> That's an inside strike. It may have hit you, but your job is to get out of the way of it. Right? And if you don't get out of the way of it, well, sorry. So the so last week when the Jays were leading, what was it? Eight, eight to one. Eight to one. And Minifield gets pl- hit in the head. In the head. He gets beamed. Yes, he did. Did anybody from the Jays come out there and do something about it? You're up by seven runs, and this guy is like, screw you, and boom, he hits you. Do anything after that? You're hurting still over yeah, there. That, that, yeah. Mer- that was painful. Merrifield had to be replaced by Tapia. Yeah. Right? Tapia butchered a couple of balls out in left field. That's right. Make a play. Yeah. Um, anyway, you know, that was part of the, the, the demise of the Jays. And it happened so quick. But, man, I'm sorry, in baseball... A good pitcher has got to be able to pitch inside. Or these guys, the hitters are just waiting, just waiting for that pitch. Now, I brush you back, Bill, and then I throw that slider on the outside corner, okay? Makes me a much more effective pitcher. But if you're digging in, you're going to hit that slider on the outside corner. You're going to hit it to right field like like Bo does, like Vladdy does. when they. So I love that about baseball. I love a pitcher that has command Mm -hmm. and does not allow the hitter to get comfortable in the batter's box. Would you second guess uh, Schneider with the Gosman? I would second guess Schneider on about six different calls. What okay. are you talking about? Right. Here's, this was the worst part of it all. You bring in um, Meza to pitch for Gosman. He's at 95 pitches. He leads eight to one. The bases are loaded, but the bases were loaded with nobody out, and then he got two outs. So with the base loaded, no one out, he gets a strikeout and he gets a pop up. Now there's two outs. You're up 8-1. The bases are loaded, and Carlos Santana's coming up. And last time Carlos Santana came up, he hit a double off the top of the wall against Gosman. So Schneider is like, you know what? Gosman's at 95 pitches. I got to get him out of there, right? And I can't have him face Santana. Well, Santana's a switch hitter. And Schneider should have known or something to say, look, if I bring in Meza, who's having trouble with right-handed hitters like he did against Aaron Judge, gave up the 60-second home run, right? Um, I'm not sure I want to bring in Meza. And if you look at the numbers for Carlos Santana as a right-handed hitter, he's much better. 
He's mm-hmm. 80 points better as a right-handed hitter That's right. than a left-handed hitter. Instead, so he puts him in there. And Mays is nervous, and he throws a wild pitch. And now there's runners that at That wild se- pitch set it up. And now there's runners at second yeah. and third. And now the score is 8-2. to two, And now you've got first base open. You've got first base open. So the thing to do now is you walk Santana. And you pitch to the next guy. you have two outs already. That's right. And you pitch to the next guy. And I can't think of who the next guy was, but he was not a good hitter. He's the number eight hitter in the lineup. Mm -hmm. You take your chances with that guy. Yeah. All right? They didn't. They pitched to Santana. He hit a three-run homer. They should have walked Santana, pitched to the next guy. I forget his name. um, Who eventually eventually Mesa struck out. After Carlos Santana hit the three-run homer, this next guy, whoever it was, struck him out. So why why would the score eight to two? Why wouldn't you walk Santana, who's killed you, who's a veteran player and hits very well from the left, from the right side against lefties? Why wouldn't you just walk him and let Mesa pitch to the next guy, who he ended up striking out anyway? Yeah. He didn't. That was the mistake. The other one was putting Tapia in at left field to replace Merrifield. You want good defenders in the late innings protecting a lead. He didn't have good defenders. He had a beaten up, battered up George Springer who whacked himself against the wall for the umpteenth time, right? He's got Tapia in left who's, they're playing deep. This blooper that Bo tried to make an amazing play on, if he leaves it alone, maybe Springer makes the play. Instead, he had to change his route. But even after that, Yimmy Garcia pitched beautifully. Pitched to two guys, didn't come out for the next inning. They brought out Anthony Bass. Then you bring in Romano with nobody out and two on. In the eighth inning, he needs to get six outs. I mean, once in a while, you have him for four outs. You say, I need you for the final out of the eighth yeah. and then sweep the nine. But here, you're asking a lot of the guy. So, you know, he gives up the he gives up a hit, he gives up the blooper, and then he's still in there the next inning, and then he gives up the go-ahead run because it was 9-9 nine, nine after that blooper. And we could have still won that game, Bill, yeah. because the next inning, I think it was, it was the eighth, Bichette singles, Steals second. Now he's in scoring position. It's 9-9 at the time. You've got Vladdy and then Kirk coming up with Bo at second in a 9-9 game. And nobody was enthused. I didn't hear the crowd going wild. It was like Let's they get left. that go-ahead yeah. run. Yeah, it's like they're gone. The air was out of the balloon. Even yeah. Buck Martinez and Pat Tabler, even when Bo singled and then, or did he single or did he walk? I forget. And then stole second. There was no excitement from the announcers yeah. because we knew. We kind of knew. It was inevitable. Now, they could have yeah. come back. They could have scored. Vladdy or Kirk could have singled. Bo could have had the go-ahead run. And then you would have had Romano out there and you know, in, in now another save situation. But he's at 25 or 29 pitches or whatever. And so, I don't know. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think Schneider blew it. Yeah. Great stuff, Mark. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, buddy. It's Gloria Martin on Entertainment. It's Gloria Martin on entertainment uh, after the holidays. Welcome in. Yes, and the weather's been spectacular, and aren't we lucky? It's been beautiful. We weren't expecting this, but kind of of goes along with summer because summer was so amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's just continuing. It's all all just gorgeous for getting out, and I'm getting out as much as possible, so not really diving into the entertainment scene and dark movie theaters until uh, till it gets a bit cooler. Okay, so what's up with you? <laughs> well, I, I have to mention today the passing of Angela Lansbury, uh, just a terrific uh, actress, singer, dancer, stage, screen, TV. Uh, she was amazing. Never had the opportunity to, to interview her, but I have such fond memories of watching Murder, She Wrote with my mother for so many years and, and such an enjoyable, sweet time. I will always associate uh, Angela with my mother. And it, she was um, just amazing. She was a good fa- friend of Ed Mervish. One of her early productions, stage productions, uh, was at the uh, Royal Ale- Alexandra Theatre when it first opened. And there is a picture of her in that production, uh, or with Ed, I forget, on the stairs at the Royal Alex. And uh, just a terrific gal. I remember I had the uh, the opportunity to uh, give her manager a call when Ed passed away to uh, to let her know. And they were very grateful uh well, not happy to hear the news that he had passed away, but they were they were grateful that I'd let them know. You know, it's interesting too. She played Elvis's mother like sixty years ago <laughs> <laughs> in films, and, and I do. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
Oh, it's so many great performers. I mean, I, I loved her in The Manchurian Candidate. She played this awful woman uh, opposite uh, Lawrence Harvey and Frank Sinatra and Janet Lee, And just a, wow, what a drama that was. You know, and I used to pass the uh, theater where uh, Maine was, right? Uh, in the 60s, and it, in big lights, it was Angela Lansbury. It seemed like she was yeah. always on Broadway. Yeah, for sure. And and uh, later in life, having such a big success with uh, Beauty and the Beast. And Sweeney Todd, too, was it? And Sweeney Todd, yeah. yeah Fantastic. Amazing. Anyway, she will be missed. A great life. She was uh, five days away from her 97th birthday. That's it. And so what else is going on? Who did you, who did you speak to this week? Well, you know, uh, if you want to be an actor, there's a lot of things you need to know. And, and some people don't even know how to get started. So I, I had run into a young actor uh, during TIFF who was just getting his career going. And he seemed to have a handle on how to do it. So I spoke to him about getting started in acting, what your mental attitude has to be, what you actually have to do to, to get ahead. And uh, his name is Chris Gonzalez, and uh, he's a terrific guy. And he seems to have the, the right attitude and uh, the right amount of uh, ambition to put it all together. And anybody who wants to get into the acting business will, will find uh, he has a lot of insight for them. Let's have a listen now. So, Chris, you're an actor from Toronto. Uh, when did you start to get into acting, and, and what prompted you to do that? What was your, your calling for acting? So, when I was younger, my mom put me in acting when I was a child. I was um, I actually sold headshots from 1991. Um, I went to the children's television studios, and I just, as a child, I just took classes and wanted to do it then. I was always drawn to film and TV. But then I'm the oldest of four kids, and when the other three started to show up, um, it just became too expensive and too time-consuming for me to continue. So my mom put me in sports and did that for maybe 15 years, and then I had a shoulder injury and couldn't do it anymore. And I decided to go back to it because acting, nothing's impossible, really. Um, you know, one day you could be, a doctor, then you could be a scientist, then you could be a, an astronaut. You can go, you know, a thousand years to the future, a thousand years into the past. You can make alternate histories. Like nothing really, nothing prevent. There's you can do anything you want really, and it's just a cool. Even though it's fake, it's just a cool thing to do. And I've never really wanted to do a, a office job like a nine to five job. Even my non acting jobs, like I worked in a restaurant. I know it's a cliche thing for an actor, but you got to make money. Um, I do that to make money. Even then before that I worked in professional, I worked in baseball for a couple of years. That's definitely not nine to five. That could be 8 a.m. to midnight. Um, so that's right. it's just always drawn to just being unique. What, what sports were you in uh, yourself when you started out? So I played uh, baseball a lot. I, um, I actually went to college in California in San Diego. And I played baseball there, and then I graduated with a degree in psychology and sociology. I played football as a kid. I played hockey, golf. My first job was at a golf course when I was 12. So it, it sounds like all those things are really good tools for, for acting in terms of psychology and being in great physical shape and uh, sociology. I mean, they, they all refer to acting, really, in a way, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Especially the psychology and sociology ones, for sure, because when you're acting, you're not like I'm not Chris when I'm acting. I'm I'm Jack or Steve or whoever. I'm not supposed to be me. I'm supposed to be some other person. And I think studying the way the mind works and then studying people in, in groups helps develop a character because acting is not just you don't just remember lines and then repeat the lines like anyone can do that. Um, you have to become another person and not, not literally to the point where you literally are that. Cause that's just, that's a weird kind of method way of acting that not a lot of people subscribe to, but you just essentially you're, you're somebody else and that definitely helps. And then from, from the, the athletic standpoint, it helps just, it, you have more options to get jobs because you, you're I'm coordinated enough to where, if there was a, a film or a show or something on stage that required athletic 
ability, I, I'd look like I knew what I was doing. Say there's a film about baseball. I can pull off being a professional baseball player. In real life, I can't, but on the screen, I can. So that's that's beneficial yeah. to all that. Now, for people who are listening who are, you know, maybe they're interested in, in getting into acting as well, what was the hardest thing about getting started? And did you did, was the first thing you had to do was get an agent? Uh, you don't need to have an agent right off the bat. But for me, though, I find the hardest part of the entire process is getting an agent. That's probably the hardest thing because – I, when I was when I was starting off, I went to agent panels and I've read a lot of stuff online about agents and stuff. And they'll tell you, like the first time I went to an agent, the weirdest thing was the door was locked. So you don't, you can't just walk in the same way you can walk into, you know, a dentist or a doctor's office. And right outside the door, there was a little bin, and it said, "Please drop CVs, resumes, and headshots in this bin," because every week by say Friday afternoon, they probably have 150 to 200 people submitting resumes and headshots and you, there's not enough time in the day for an agent to sit there and sort through all that stuff while also working for the clients they already have. And what makes it hard is that there's no prerequisite to doing acting, right? So if you want to, like, say you want to be a lawyer, you have to, you go to, you do your undergrad and then you go to law school and you have to pass the, the LSATs and the bar or whatever, and then you become a lawyer. You can't just become a lawyer, right? Whereas acting, you don't have to go to drama school. You don't have to take classes. You can just, they can just put you on the set and say, here you go, act. It makes it difficult, especially at the beginning, because the competition is thousands of people. And how do you, how do you work your way up that ladder? How do you even get an agent to look at you? Because again, if the agents are getting 200 resumes a week, then have time to look. How did you do it? How did you get an agent? So what, what I ended up doing, my, I, you could submit yourself to things by yourself and kind of build a foundation that way. I was on um, Casting Workbook, which is like an online casting database. And I had credits and stuff from the things I'd done on my own. And an agent saw me on there and sent me an email saying, you know, everything looks great. Can you coming for a meeting and that's how I got my first agent. It's that's kind of how they do it. They kind of find you more than you find them. But oh. since then I've also sent like, I don't, I'm not with that agent anymore because I moved to Australia for a year and then I just, she doesn't work in Australia, obviously. So we're no longer together, but to this day, I still send stuff out to get a new agent because it's, it's just what, what I do when I send stuff out is that I try to, you try to, you have to, you have to present value. Like what value do you bring to the agent? You can't just say, here are my headshots. This is, this is what, this is where I've studied. This is what you know, the teachers I've learned under. For me, the value I try to bring when I send stuff to the agents, I say, look, I played college baseball and I'm athletic. I also have a second stripe brown belt in karate. That's one below a black belt. Any sort of action, physical type movements, I can make them look believable. I can look coordinated enough to where it's believable. And something like that helps because an agent may not have somebody like that on their roster. Yeah, that's great. Um, now, were you yeah. aside from aside from the child classes? Did you study any other acting classes? Take any other acting classes, or did you just do the the dive in and let's do it, let let's act route? So when I when I finished my uh, my working in baseball career in twenty, I think it was fifteen. I spent a year taking classes around Toronto and I did a lot of work as an extra as well. So I found that both of them worked. So the first thing I did was I went to Lewis Baumander, one of the most acclaimed teachers in the city. He, uh, he's been doing it for, I want to say 40 years now. He has a really good acting studio. And um, that's where I learned a lot of just ways of doing the craft. I also went to a couple other ones in the studio. They weren't as good, but Lewis is one of the best ones. And while I was doing that, I also got a job as an extra and an extra is pretty much you're just like a shadow in the background or a blur in the background you're just filling in the space but I found that really helped because you're literally on a set watching the professionals do their job and it's one thing to sit in the class and and take notes and study and do all that stuff in a classroom setting but when you actually go onto a set and you can see them do it I found both those things helped create the craft that I need to put forward to be, to become a, 
working actor. Great. Great. So tell me now, uh, what have you done? What are some of the roles you've played and, and where's your career at, at this moment in time? So when I started, I landed a couple of commercials, national commercials. The first one was for TSN. That was pretty cool. It was an NHL trade deadline commercial, which was just all over Canada. And then I also did one for Canadian Tire. And then I did a couple uh, short films. One was called Room 121. It was from a, a British international student who was studying at U of T at the time. Um, that film did a couple of film festivals in the UK. I also did a student film at Sheridan that won the People's Choice Award. Um, the year it was made, it was uh, it's called Death of the Author. I was the lead in that. And then my most prominent role was a film called Operation Avalanche that premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. I had a small role as one of the CIA agents in that film. Essentially what it is, it's a film about if the moon landing was fake and if the CIA or if the guys that doing it were just staging it to make it to make it seem like they were going to win the, the race to the moon against the Soviets. Yeah. That was pretty cool because yeah, that's... No, I was just, I was just, sorry. It was just going to say like, it's, I, I, I didn't go to Sundance because I, I was just a small supporting role, but it's cool that something like that was at Sundance and then the credits are rolling and your name's in the credits. It was a pretty cool um, thing to do. And then yeah. from, from that, I've tried to move on to more things. I've come close to, I almost auditioned for a, a Netflix show in Australia called Pine Gap. Um, I auditioned for a film a film a couple months ago starring Daisy Ridley of Star Wars. Uh, I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't get that role, but um, I'm starting to work into more bigger productions from from there. Great. Do you find uh, there's a lot of films being made in Toronto right now and a lot of opportunities? Yeah, that's there's a lot in Canada at the moment. Um, Ontario has a lot. Uh, BC also has a lot. Quebec has a lot. And then Alberta is actually picking up. One of the the biggest productions in all of Canada was an HBO show called The Last of Us, which is based off of um, a video game that filmed in Alberta all of last year. And it's going to be on HBO, I think, in January. Um, but Canada's there's a ton filming. Like There's probably more filming in Toronto than New York. So it's like Los Angeles would be number one, but then Toronto's, I think, number two. Toronto often stands in for New York, and it's cheaper. So there's yeah. plenty of opportunities. It's just... The hardest thing is, is, like I was saying, getting an agent and getting the opportunity to get into the room to audition. Well, it sounds like you're on the, the right path, Chris. Do you have any uh, other, other last advice for someone who's starting out and wants to get into the business? I would say the number one thing is you have to get used to rejection and get used to the word no. And if you can't handle failing a lot, then it's not really something to do. And I know that sounds a little weird. It's just, even when you audition, like you could go to 20 auditions and if you get one role out of that, that's considered good. And it's not, it's not bad. It's not like you, you failed 19 times because you didn't, because there's, there's many different things that go into casting someone. Um, you know, for example, like uh, friends, the three actresses and friends, one has blonde hair, one has black hair, one has brown hair. That's not a coincidence. And, and then there's like, there's your eye color, there's your height, there's your skin color, and there's all sorts of different things that go into casting. So you just, the biggest thing is just you get into the room, you do what you can, and then you just leave it in the room and let it go because you can't control anything outside of that. Very good advice, Chris. Very good advice yeah. indeed. Well, listen, good luck with your uh, upcoming auditions. I, I hope you land that big juicy role real soon. Thanks so much appreciate it it's tough we'll see i mean a lot of it's right time right place but you never know unless you unless you try right it's better to try and fail than not try at all absolutely thanks chris thanks Gloria. thanks for your time appreciate it great conversation there and chris gets that starring role uh opposite tom cruise that he'll uh, he'll <laughs> give us a call again <laughs> mission possible right yes exactly mission possible good one <laughs> thanks so much Gloria. appreciate it Thanks, Bill. Take care. Have a good week. We've had a good show, Jessica. Always a good show. Always a great show, Bill. Yeah, I like, I like your attitude. Yeah. I like it so much. Why don't you come back next week and uh, we'll do this again. Can I really? How many years have we been doing this together? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I think it's at least going on five years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, well, it's, a, it's been a great five years. It's been such a fantastic five years. Well, let's say goodbye to everybody. Bye, everyone. Have a great rest of the weekend. Right here on The Bill King Show. Thank you for all who tuned in to The Bill King Show. We'll catch you on the other side.